Last fall, we introduced you to a man with an unusual name you'd probably never heard of. But his message about education and America's future is something we thought you should know. Freeman Hrabowski says, the United States is not producing enough scientists and engineers, professions critical to creating more jobs. Hrabowski is president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC as it's called, was once known primarily as a commuter school. Today, this mid-sized state university has earned a reputation as one of the most innovative schools in the country, especially when it comes to getting students into math and science and keeping them there. How Freeman Hrabowski got to UMBC is a journey through American history, and there's a story in his name. The story will continue in a moment. I'm not sure how to phrase this um, in a delicate way, but uh, how does a black man get a name Hrabowski? <laughs> You asking the question that most people just look at me and think, and they don't know how to ask it. My grandfather's grandfather was the Polish slave master in rural Alabama. And Freeman? And Freeman. I'm the third, Freeman Rabowski the third, and my grandfather was the first one born a free man, as opposed to having to be freed. Freeman Rabowski was an only child, his parents both educators. He grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, when segregation was law and the Civil Rights Movement was growing. This is Birmingham, the South's mightiest industrial city, as the world knew it this week. In May 1963, Rabowski was in the Children's March, organized by Martin Luther King Jr., a march made infamous when Sheriff Eugene Bull Connor unleashed dogs and fire hoses on the demonstrators. In the midst of it was 12-year-old Freeman Rabowski, who had his own encounter with Bull Connor. He asked me, what do you want, little Negro? I was so scared, and he's a big guy. And I said, uh, we want to kneel and pray. All we wanted to do was to kneel and pray for our freedom. That was it. And he picked me up, he spat in my face, and threw me into the paddy wagon. He spit on you? He did indeed. He did indeed. It was an awful experience. And it took years for me to get over that. It taught me that even kids can make decisions that can have an impact on the rest of their lives. And it also taught me the importance of getting support from each other in that experience. It was frightening. I was there five days. In jail for five days. In jail for five days. It was awful, and yet it was rich. Rabowski excelled in school. At age 12, he was in the ninth grade. At 15, he went to college, where he studied math and began a career devoted to higher education. Since 1992, he's been president of UMBC, a state university on the outskirts of Baltimore. We want people to take ownership of UMBC. He uses the lessons from that Birmingham jail of the importance of commitment and support from others as he leads the university today. There's this balance between being nurturing and supportive here at UMBC, but also about setting very high standards. We are preparing students to compete against and work with people from all over the world. And they're working. They're working hard. They're working very hard, and this is very interesting. We have to teach Americans of all races, from all backgrounds, what it takes to be the best. And at the heart of it is the same thing we saw when we were kids, hard work. Nothing, I don't care how smart you are, nothing takes the place of hard work. Much of the hard work at UMBC is in science, engineering, and math, which accounted for 41% of the bachelor's degrees earned there last year, well above the national average of 25%. Nationwide, most college students who start off in the sciences either change to a different major or don't graduate. UMBC keeps undergrads engaged by including them in research typically left to graduate students. These students are investigating the secrets of HIV. And we need hands-on experiences, we need to be encouraging that curiosity, and people cannot, should not be allowed simply to sit back and be bored. Students can also get jobs and internships at one of 76 companies located on campus. Most are technology startups. They get help growing their businesses and tax credits, along with access to students and faculty. One thing you won't find at UMBC... You had a chance to get a football team at UMBC, right? <laughs> and you said talk no. about that. Right. I mean, well, first of all, it takes a lot of money for a football team to win. 
Rabowski prefers to win on different playing fields. Incoming freshman Francois Rice noticed right away. It seems like everything's flipped, where you might go to another university and the football team might be top dog. Here, it's the chess team that's top dog. <laughs> and it's the chess team. Yeah, it's cool to be smart. Rice is part of the 23rd incoming class of Meyerhoff Scholars, a program that recruits high achievers in math, science, and engineering, who are aiming for graduate degrees and careers in research. The Meyerhoff Scholars, what's that concept? It is that we can create a program that focuses on both excellence and inclusiveness starting with African-Americans and then Hispanics and now whites and Asian students of all races who are excellent in science and engineering. We need people from all backgrounds. And Meyerhoff says it can be done. The program started in 1988 when Rabowski teamed up with billionaire philanthropist Robert Meyerhoff. Both men worry that African-American males were shut out from careers in the sciences from lack of opportunity, not talent. Over the years, the program expanded to all students and helped put UMBC and Rabowski on the map of higher education. I love science. Math are definitely my passions. There's like so You're many... You're passionate about math and science. Oh, definitely. That's not... <laughs> Rahel so. Zeman, Deborah Silver, and Elaban Ortiz are all interested in medical research. Michael Roberts and Francois Rice want to be mechanical engineers. Time's up. Put your bags down. To get them jump-started, UMBC runs a summer boot camp for the new Meyerhoff Scholars, with surprising rules for such a high-tech generation. There's the no cell phone rule, no Facebook, no electronics, no... No headphones. <laughs> There's just so many, but the point is they want us to be socializing and, and form real bonds and relationships with each other. It requires energy to, to dissolve. Yeah. So when for six weeks, they work hard. But the most important lesson they get is how to work together. The key to success, they're told, is collaboration, not competition. Next question. Okay. To reinforce the idea, the 72 young scholars are required to learn together, study together, live together, and move around campus together, literally. Gaps in a line are not allowed. You could be worried, you know, oh, I might not make it or stuff. But then there's the 72 people right around you saying that you can do it. We have 72 teachers all around us. It just makes such a difference that I love. 72 teachers, that's how you describe your, your Definitely. classmates. Definitely. Definitely, because I can safely say that we can all learn from each other and teach each other. We make this assumption that either math and science are for you or they're not. You know, I get goosebumps during math. I always have. Goosebumps. So, goosebumps. I always have. Students laugh at me, but my students get goosebumps during math and science. We love it. He always tells this story about, you know, 19 years old and graduating from college and how he used to get goosebumps doing math problems. And all I can remember as a 17-year-old thinking to myself was, I never want to be like that. <laughs> Anybody but that guy. Yeah. Kafwi Darasa loved to take apart computers as a kid and says he breezed through high school without too much effort. He went to UMBC as a Meyerhoff scholar in 1997, thinking about his next track meet, not a career in science. When I got to UMBC, I had no idea what research was. In fact, for about the first eight months, I lied about wanting a PhD because I didn't know what a PhD was. Today, Dr. Darasa has both a PhD in engineering and a medical degree. He heads up a research team at Duke University, studying the brain and mental illness. I seek to understand the range of human suffering that comes in the context of psychiatric illness. And this is what the brain cell activity looks like. And so Darasa says the problems are too complex for one scientist to solve alone. That means the first critical step to success in his lab and most other labs, he says, is building the right team. And you learned all that at UMBC, that, that, that framework of the kinds of skills you need. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and I think that that was the most beneficial thing that I got out of UMBC, believing in myself as a scientist and learning how to work with others, how to think deeply, how to seek people who were great in other areas without being intimidated in that and build teams to solve problems together. So far, 873 students have come out of the Meyerhoff Scholars Program, and nearly 90% of them have gone on to graduate school. Good morning.
Hrabowski worries, though, that the U.S. is not doing enough to create more homegrown scientists. Most people don't realize that only about 10 percent of Americans in 1965 had a college education. And today? But, and today we're up to about 25 percent. He says the difference is that 50 years ago, most jobs didn't require a college degree. Today, we need more education. We need people with post-secondary training. We need people with two-year degrees and four-year degrees and people in graduate programs. If we're going to talk about making sure they can take care of their families, and if we're going to talk about meeting the needs of companies and agencies in our own country. So what do you want to do when you graduate? What do you I'm going to be a teacher. Oh, I love it. Teacher. I love it. Around campus, Rabowski is a familiar sight, full of encouragement and contagious enthusiasm. It's fun. I like that class a lot. You like yeah. genetics. Yeah, the lab is really good. I like that. We say at the beginning of the year, uh, look at the student to your left, look at the student to your right. Most people who've gone to college heard the dean say, one of you will not graduate, all right? And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I'm at all insecure, or if I know I'm a little immature, I'm going to say, oh my goodness, he's talking about me, so I may as well party this year because I'm not going to be here next year anyway. And it happens, right? We say, look at the student to your left, look at the student to your right. Our goal is to make sure all three of you graduate. And if you don't, we fail, and we don't plan to fail because we accepted you because we know you can do this work. But aren't you just romanticizing the possibilities? Because they're, they're, <laughs> many kids right. just won't make it because they won't do the work. Right. Or they're not bright enough to right. be there and be successful. But, so do you just say, well, those who are already ready to, to study hard, they'll make it and let the rest fail? I think that's not what an educator should do. I want you to keep dreaming about the possibilities. Nothing takes the place of hard work, attitude, and getting support from each other. And that's what, that's what this is all about. Focus, focus, focus. Give yourselves a hand. Keep working hard. <laughs>